Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webcast, Cassandra Lessons Learned from Supporting 2,000 Clusters. We have a great webinar planned for you today. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. The presentation will last about an hour. Questions are welcome, and we encourage you to type any questions you have throughout the webinar into the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your screen. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation when all of your questions will be answered. As a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand shortly after the webcast concludes. Please see the attachment sections for other helpful content, as well as after the webinar, the PDF version of the slides will be available. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Brooke Thorley, VP of Technical Operations. Brooke is responsible for InstaCluster's technical operations, consisting of dedicated engineers and Apache Cassandra and Spark experts with extensive operational experience. Brooke, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Gina. Okay, so today, uh, my presentation, I'll be going through uh, some of the key things that you'll encounter in managing your Apache Cassandra cluster. Uh, some lessons learned, uh, we manage over uh, uh, nearly a thousand nodes here at InstaCluster, uh, and that's spread across a couple hundred clusters. Uh, we have a, a very diverse range of customers. We see a lot of different use cases of Cassandra. Um, we see a lot of problems happening in Cassandra, and today I'd just like to bring in some of that, that knowledge uh, to help you managing your own cluster. So how this uh, is going to run today, uh, firstly, I'll just cover some important concepts that you need to know as an operations engineer uh, in managing a cluster, uh, and because and, that will link uh, onto uh, slides further in the presentation. Uh, then I'll look at uh, how you can detect and diagnose problems in the cluster, so uh, what you should alert on, where you should look if you get alerted. Uh, I'm going to deep dive into managing compactions on a cluster because it's a very common issue that we see uh, and we spend quite a lot of time uh, doing in technical operations in the cluster. Uh, I'll talk about cluster mutations, so that's uh, adding nodes, removing nodes, replacing nodes, uh, adding data, data centers. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how you might want to design your cluster uh, for maximum availability, but also making the ongoing uh, maintenance and management of that cluster much easier for you. Uh, and then it, right at the end, I've got a, just a, a slide of some summary of some, some final tips, uh, lessons learned, the, probably the hard way, uh, and uh, I want to share those with you. So let's move in. Okay, compactions. Uh, it's a fundamental concept in Cassandra. Uh, you need to understand how uh, data is written to disk or the write path. Uh, when data is written into Cassandra, it goes into memory in what's called a mem table. Uh, these are periodically flushed to disk, uh, and that's called an SS table once it's on disk. These SS table files are immutable, which means that they never change once written to disk. Um, and obviously, as, as more and more writes happen, if updates happen, you might get uh, different copies of the data in different SS tables. Uh, compaction is the process of consolidating that, all of those SS tables together into new fresh ones um, to improve read performance. Uh, it's an ongoing background in process in Cassandra. <coughs> uh, it's happening all the time. Um, and it, it's, uh, what determines when compactions are running is the, the uh, compaction properties that you set on each table. I'm not going to get too much into that today. Um, my colleague Ben Slater did a great presentation about this um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, he goes into this in quite a bit more detail, but really my focus for today is an ops presentation. I see these are concepts you need to know. Final thing that you really need to understand <clears throat> when managing compactions is that it does not necessarily equal compression. Uh, whilst that compaction is running, it's, it's running that new SS table uh, in temporary, as a temporary SS table. Um, so you potentially need the, at least the size for the three S tables that are being merged. <coughs> Tombstones is another uh, 
thing we spend a lot of time dealing with here at InstaCluster. Uh, you need to understand that when you delete data in Cassandra, it's not immediately purged from the database. Uh, rather, it's, it's marked for the deletion and it's marked with something called a tombstone. Uh, tombstones will hang around in, in SS tables for a period of time uh, until they're purged. Now, what determines that is uh, the two things, GC grace settings, uh, GC grace seconds rather, uh, that is a property on the table, which is the minimum amount of time that uh, tombstones are kept uh, before they're considered purgeable. Now, really key concept, they're not purged until the next compaction of the SS table in which they are stored. What this means is that tombstones can remain for quite a lot longer than what you uh, think that they will or hope that they will, particularly if you're using something like leveled compaction strategy. Uh, if you've got uh, tombstones or deletes hanging around in, in those older SS tables, it can be quite a long time before you get another one uh, in that level uh, that will be triggered for a compaction uh, and actually purge those tombstones. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, an alternative, you can use TTLs on cells. Uh, this uh, gets around uh, the need to, to do a repair to, to populate, uh, to propagate the tombstone. Because uh, as soon as the cell expires, it's treated as deleted. Consistency. Um, this is important in understanding to manage your cluster, excuse me. Um, there's two factors here. So the replication factor, which defines how many replicas of, of data should be stored in the cluster. And the consistency level uh, that's set at the, the application or the query level about how many replicas must respond to the query before it's considered a success. When we say data becomes inconsistent, that means that not all replicas that should have the data actually have the data. And that can happen for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, an example might be that <clears throat> a node is down for maintenance uh, longer than the hinted handoff window, which is three hours, and it misses out on, on the rights that should have, should have gone to that node in that period of time. Uh, the only way to fix this is doing repairs. <clears throat> okay, uh, now we move into how do you detect problems in Cassandra? What should you monitor for? It's a question I get comp um, asked quite a lot. Um, you know, what, what do we monitor for? How, how do we detect when things are going, going on out in the fleet? There's a few key metrics that we look at um, and that, that we alert on. Um, probably the main, most important one is nodes down. Uh, so if you were to type in node tool status, uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen the, seen the output there, it gives you a simple state for each of the nodes uh, that's pulled from gossip. Um, you want all nodes to be up. Uh, if any nodes are down, um, that's something that you should be investigating. <clears throat> the next indicator that we, uh, that we look at is uh, latency. Um, so this is, uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of different latency metrics that you can look at in Cassandra. Um, you know, I, I've used client uh, reason rights here because that's really what your, your application or clients will see uh, and you will have a particular threshold that's appropriate for your application. Um, but increased latency on a node uh, is definitely cause for investigation. Sometimes it's, you know, just really related to uh, to the load that's being placed on it at that point in time. Um, but even then, that's, that's worth investigating because if that's happening in a, on an ongoing basis during your peak processing periods, probably an indication that you, that you need to add nodes to the cluster or take some other action. Uh, the next one down the bottom, skipping down to the bottom, pending compactions. Uh, if the nodes are not keeping up with compactions, uh, that definitely an indicator that that something's uh, happening there. That um, either there's too many writes going on, 
uh, or, or the nodes falling behind for some other reason, definitely uh, worth investigating. Uh, so those are the ones, uh, the ones marked with a double star are what we continually monitor and alert on, so that actually goes to our page duty. Uh, other ones that we keep an eye on uh, but don't necessarily go to page duty uh, are tombstones per read and SS tables per read. Again, this is kind of linked to, to compactions, um, but uh, if either of those things are elevated, um, you're probably going to be seeing an impact to your to the read performance in the cluster. Uh, and CF read latency, uh, just know that um, you know we have some customers who are particularly sensitive to to latency in particular column families, um, and rather than focusing on sort of overall uh, cluster query latency, uh, we can narrow right down into to particular column families. So there, there is thousands and thousands of metrics available in Cassandra. Okay, so. What happens uh, if, if I'm alerted to, to a problem on, on a cluster? The, the first thing I would do when I log on to a node is just run a quick node tool status to see what the overall view of the cluster is. Um, <clears throat> what I'm looking for in, in node tool status is any down nodes. So in this particular example, uh, all the nodes in this cluster are reporting up. Uh, but if, if a node is down, you'll see DN. Uh, and and Nodetool status will give you an overview of, of all the DCs in the cluster if, if you're running a multi-DC cluster. Uh, if, if nodes are down, uh, the next thing I do is, is log on to that down node and have a look maybe why it's, it's reporting down. Um, is Cassandra crashed? Is it just running slow? Uh, the instance terminated? Uh, anything like that. Uh, obviously, you want all of your nodes to be up at all times and participating in queries for, for maximum availability and performance. The next thing I might want to look at is what's happening internally in Cassandra. Uh, so to, for that, you use uh, TP stats, which stands for Thread Pool Statistics. Be aware that the counts um, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, completed in all time uh, are from the last Cassandra restart. Uh, active and pending are the active and pending threads uh, if, if for, this, for this node. Uh, so this example uh, I pulled from a cluster that was doing a huge data load uh, and the customer was uh, complaining that some of the queries were timing out uh, and they were getting poor performance uh, and errors on their, on their application. Uh, so you know, we logged on, had a look at TP stats and we can immediately see that uh, there's a problem here with, with the mutation stage or the, the write stage. Um, there's 128 active threads, which is okay. Yeah, that's doing a lot of work, um, but you know you can see that there's uh, a very large number of pending, pending mutation threads, um, and mostly that would probably time out. That's exactly what they what they were seeing. Ideally, in a cluster that that's keeping up and that's performing well, you wouldn't want to see really uh, very many pending threads at all. You know, maybe a couple, but certainly not hundreds of thousands. Um, TP stats gives you another little little table down the bottom, uh, and that is a summary of drop messages. Again, be aware that is a count since the last Cassandra restart. So you might see 10,000 read, uh, dropped read messages here, but that may have occurred several days ago, um, it, or it may be happening now. Uh, you can confirm this by looking in the logs. Uh, dropped read messages, drop mutations are also um, printed out in the logs, uh, but certainly. Uh, any node that's dropping messages is uh, definitely a cause for further investigation. Okay, next thing I'd be looking at is the Cassandra logs uh, to see what might be happening there. Uh, what's an indication of a problem? So obviously the first thing, any errors. Um, there's uh, an example here I've pulled uh, this particular cluster was uh, scanning over 200,000 tombstones. Uh, the, the customer was complaining that they were seeing some some timeouts in their queries, and you know we can go and look in the logs and uh, and see that's exactly uh, what what the cause was. So uh, you know the, the answer to, to that particular issue that we detected was you know too many tombstones in this particular column family. 
other things that you'll see that could be indications that are not necessarily uh, printed as errors, but certainly uh, would have a noticeable impact on the performance and potentially stability on the cluster. Uh, large partition warnings, um, so this one here, compacting large row. Um, certainly, uh, I've seen plenty of cases where where nodes, uh, individual nodes, have extremely high latency while it's doing these uh, large row compactions. Um, usually coupled with the next one, um, very long GC pauses, so uh, long kind of stop the world garbage collection pauses. If you're seeing that frequently in your logs, uh, be aware that whilst that GC is happening, um, nothing's happening in Cassandra. So your, uh, in this particular case, your end query that was running at that time you know, would have been waiting for, for the uh, 13 seconds uh, that the node was doing GC. <clears throat> Uh, another warning uh, that, um, again, uh, you might uh, might show up as um, slow queries on the client side uh, is using this unlogged batch over, over multiple partitions. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, so if if you're seeing slow queries in in the application, you you know, one thing to do is definitely check the logs to see if there's if Cassandra is printing out some reason why that particular is that particular query is is running slow. Um, so now some some preventative maintenance. Obviously, it's better to uh, pre prevention is better than than cure, as, as the old saying goes. <coughs> um, so th this is really the approach we take here at InstaCluster. We, we keep an eye on things and try to correct them before they become a major, major problem. Uh, one key thing is disk usage. Uh, you want to try and keep that under 70% on all nodes to allow enough headroom for compactions and natural data growth to happen. Um, trying to recover a, a node from a, a full disk is, I, I can tell you, rather painful. Uh, it's usually can't be done without some sort of downtime and potentially some data loss. <clears throat> so obviously you want to try and prevent that from happening. Uh, as I said, uh, said in, in the monitoring slide just previously, things like instance per read, SS tables per read and, and large partitions in any of your tables, you know, if these things are trending up, that's an indication that it's going to be having an impact on your on your read performance, uh, and uh, you need to investigate why this is is the case, um, and, and take some action. Uh, backups, um, you know, I, I'm not going into too much detail about backups in this particular presentation. Uh, in a well-designed Cassandra cluster, you, you really have inbuilt. Um, in built backups because you have multiple copies of the data in in each uh, around the cluster. Um, but certainly, I mean, we do take backups that in the cluster that if you have a catastrophic failure uh, or if you don't have your, your replication factor set uh, high enough, uh, there are certainly instances where you can experience data loss and may need to restore from backup. Uh, if you're taking backups, obviously you want to make sure that that process is working. Uh, and ideally check your restore as well. Uh, final thing, uh, repair status. If you are running repairs, um, make sure they are completing. Um, I think we're going to do a, a whole other webinar on repairs. It's a very uh, broad topic, um, but certainly uh, keep an eye on that if you are, <coughs> are running repairs. So in a healthy cluster, you know, I'd expect to, to see uh, none of these uh, items uh, triggering alerts. You know, the, the disk would be under 70%. Uh, all of these other metrics are looking healthy um, uh, and be you no know, cause for concern. Okay. So <clears throat> I am going to deep dive into to managing compactions here because it's probably the thing that we spend most of our time managing here in InstaCluster. Uh, there's one thing that commonly causes issues in clusters, uh, it's, it's compaction overhead. Um, <clears throat> so, and you know, talking to some of our, our support customers, it's something that they uh, have had a lot of problems with too, uh, and it's frequently the cause of unexplained latency. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, okay. Uh, so I said, cause of unexplained latency. So uh, co common common sequence of events that, that, that I see is uh, latency in the cluster all of a sudden just skyrockets for no particular reason. Um, what what you'll see is the the read and write activity actually drop off. Um, <clears throat> Uh, which is okay. So this the, the, the charts here show quite quite clearly. Um, so a single node uh, doing compactions can cause latency across the whole cluster. Uh, this is exactly what happened here. Uh, so a a node uh, got behind, or a couple of nodes in this cluster got behind on compactions. You can see at the same time uh, the read latency uh, sort of skyrocketed. Uh, the number of client requests dropped, and of course, the CPU on those nodes also went very high as it was trying to get through these, these compactions. You can have a look at what compactions are doing with the node tool compaction stats command. Uh, ideally, you want to see the pending tasks at zero, but in this particular example, we see 518 pending compactions, indicating that this node is running quite behind. Now, what can you do? Um, <clears throat> we have a fairly standard process that, that we run here if we know that uh, a node is uh, being affected by compactions. Um, the first two things uh, that you can try is sending the compaction throughput. Now, the default in Cassandra I believe is 16, but uh, many people run at much, much higher. Uh, if you still need to have compactions ongoing in the background, uh, you can just turn this down. Uh, so that'll really just free up some more resources for Cassandra to actually uh, to, to service queries rather than the compaction. That's one thing you can try. Uh, be aware that the ongoing compaction obviously will take a bit longer to get through, um, but if, you, if your cluster performance is suffering, uh, that, that's the first thing you can try. You can stop the compaction. So this is useful um, if, say, it's doing compaction of a very, very large row. Um, and you just need to, to quickly stop it. Um, yeah, you can do that, but just be aware that it will kick off again. So it's not it's not a solution forever. It just uh, it just mitigates the the problem for a little while now. Um, to, if that particular compaction is what's causing the issue. But what we usually do, what the most common thing to do is to take the node out of the cluster uh, for a short period of time. Uh, to free up some resources for it to uh, get through its compaction backlog and also um, to uh, to stop that node from having an adverse effect on the rest of the cluster. Um, uh, so the command you use to, to do that is, I've, I've printed here, disable binary, disable gossip, disable thrift, um, and also unthrottle the compactions. Uh, so what that does is it leaves Cassandra running, but it does cut the node off. You've disabled all the, the interfaces there uh, that, that are available to client queries. Um, so, uh, and then unthrottling the compaction throughput, uh, that really opens up the, the floodgates for those compactions to complete as quickly as possible. <clears throat> uh, in the, the little chart, the, the example I've shown there, this was a, a cluster that had exactly this issue. Um, one node, uh, I think from memory, hit, uh, hit a compaction of a very large, um, a very large row. Uh, that caused a bunch of GC, that node got slow, and then uh, because it was slow, it sort of had a knock-on effect to the rest of the cluster. Um, and you can see that uh, as soon as the, the compaction started, the, whole, the latency of the cluster um, went up, and uh, the number of read requests went down. So the, the number of read requests that the cluster was able to service, uh, or the throughput that we were able to achieve, uh, was reduced whilst that, just that one compaction was running. Uh, so as soon as we took that node out of the cluster, um, you can see that the read latency dropped back down to uh, a normal level, an acceptable level, and the throughput that we were able to achieve uh, went back up to, to where it needed to be. In fact, it, it went slightly higher. Um, there's a couple of points to, to note there is uh, if you take the node out, the, you've disabled gossip, uh, 
So the other nodes will see that node is down. They will store hints uh, for that node that's out of the cluster and replay them once it's back in. But of course, you need to put it back in within the hinted handoff window. Um, nine times out of 10, uh, a node will catch up on the compactions within that three hours. I've only seen a handful of cases uh, in, in very broken clusters where, where it does take longer than that. But simple trick, uh, at two hours, 45 minutes, put the node back in. So it's uh, just the reverse of this command, node tool, enable binary, enable gossip, enable thrift. Uh, put the node back in, allow it to catch up on those hints, and, and then you can take it back out again. Uh, that gets around having the need to run a repair if it's out for more than three hours. So there, simple trick there and, and how you can uh, immediately um, uh, mitigate some of the issues that the compactions might be causing. Uh, it's very common, again, very common for us to do this. Um, uh, it's I just wanted to quickly give a couple of tips uh, on removing data um, and maybe a little bit, of, a bit more of a discussion about tombstones. So going back to what I said earlier uh, about tombstones, remember I said they can be very, very hard to get rid of. Uh, they really are. Um, one thing that we do rather commonly for customers is um, if uh, tombstones are not being or tables are not being picked up for compaction um, in a in a timely manner, I guess, to, to purge the tombstones that we know that are there. Um, we might need to go down the path of doing uh, like user-defined compactions or major compactions on a node to force purge all the tombstones that are there. Um, some little things you can do to, to maybe try and avoid having to get into that situation if you need to do um, uh, you know, clear out some data. Uh, ideally, if you can, use a truncate or drop. It uh, doesn't create tombstones, it just creates a snapshot of the table. Uh, and you can do a, a node tool clear snapshot and that space is, is released immediately. Uh, if you just went ahead and deleted all that data, you create a, a table full of tombstones uh, and you'd have to, to manage how to, to purge those potentially manually. There's just a little tip there about if you need to to clear out a whole bunch of data. So this is a, may, may be particularly relevant in, say, a, a test environment. Uh, commonly, say, people want to do this. Um, we advise them to, to do a truncated drop, just reload the data that they need. <clears throat> OK. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, how you might want to design your cluster uh, for maximum availability and easy maintenance. Now what uh, we recommend and uh, where possible the default configuration we run for our clusters here at Insta Cluster, uh, at least three nodes spread in three racks with RF3. Uh, what that gives you is a complete copy of the data in each rack. Uh, now we, we run in the cloud and AWS is, is certainly our, our most uh, our common provider, we map our logical racks in Cassandra to availability zones in AWS. So for regions where there are three availability zones, we then have three logical racks. Uh, if the customer then has a replication factor of three, uh, they've got a full set of data in each rack. Uh, for, for a three node cluster, it's maybe not quite so uh, quite so uh, relevant, I guess, but you know when you're dealing with very large clusters, you know even let's say 20, 21 node clusters, um, you don't want to be having to do things node by node. By running with this uh, this configuration, you can survive the loss of an entire rack or availability zone of nodes, and still be able to achieve quorum because you've still got two copies in the other two racks or availability zones. Um, this is great for, for, for maintenance and availability. This is great for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, typically when I see AW, or issues in AWS, network issues, um, uh, uh, um, uh, node, um, sorry, instance issues, multiple instances dying, it, it is almost always isolated to one availability zone. 
Um, so you, uh, you you can still achieve quorum when those issues are happening. For maintaining your cluster, uh, what this allows you to do is <coughs> is um, is do operations by rack rather than by node. So examples doing Cassandra upgrade where you need to restart Cassandra, you don't need to do that node by node. Uh, you can do that by whole rack. Um, uh, the other thing is repairs. If you've got copy, a uh, full copy in each rack, uh, you only need to run repair on the nodes in one rack. So by running this three by three by three configuration, um, uh, it significantly uh, it cuts down the work that, that you need to do as an ops engineer. Certainly makes life uh, a lot easier if you're running running this configuration. <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, next thing I want to talk about in managing your cluster because certainly will come up for you is cluster mutations. And this, by this I mean adding and removing nodes replacing dead nodes and adding new data centers. Key point, before you do anything, make sure your cluster is healthy and stable before you do this. Again, make sure your cluster is healthy and stable. If you don't go through a basic health check, and I mean do a node tool status, make sure all the nodes are up, make sure nothing's about to run out of this space, uh, you will potentially find yourself in a situation that you might not be able to recover from. Uh, certainly, perhaps while you're um, uh, removing a node, you don't really uh, want more nodes to go down. Or uh, if you're, yeah, say adding a node, you don't want disks on other nodes filling up, for example, and, and not being able to complete streaming. Um, make sure your cluster is healthy. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details of exactly how to add nodes because there's plenty of resources and, and step by steps on, on how to do that out on the internet. Um, but just more, more a couple of, you know, how do you know when to add nodes? Uh, so, yep, if your disks are becoming more than 70% full, if you keep writing data to your cluster, uh, you need to expand the number of nodes to, to accommodate that. Uh, that's the great thing about Cassandra, it's linearly scalable. Uh, if you have three nodes and add three more, you double the amount of storage and also processing capacity or throughput that you can get from that cluster. Um, the other reason why you might want to add nodes uh, or change the size of nodes potentially uh, is if you're you know, your latency and OS load is consistently high during your peak times. So maybe you have enough storage, but you don't have enough nodes to service the load that's being placed on the cluster. Um, yeah, those are the two key reasons why you'd want to be adding nodes. Uh, and again, you know, those, those health checks that I, that I talked about earlier in the presentation will give you an indication ahead of time uh, of when you need to add nodes. Because um, bear in mind, when you add nodes, it needs to stream data from the rest of the cluster, the other replicas from the data, from the other replicas that that the, the hold the data it is to be responsible for, and that can take some time. In in very large nodes, um, I've certainly seen this take, you know, days to stream the data. Uh, after it's streamed the data, it then needs to compact the data that it's streamed from the other clusters. Be aware, Cassandra will overstream. Um, it's just the way it works. Um, so, it, you know, you could be looking at quite a few days before you get even one node online if you're using very dense nodes. Uh, and, you know, if you need to add quite a lot of nodes, well, um, it, uh, it, 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 the time will just extend. So you do need to plan for this ahead of time. <clears throat> so a couple of tips I just wanted to give you if you're doing this. Uh, if you're using logical racks, similar to the example that I gave uh, just in the previous slides, uh, Try and keep your racks balanced. So, uh, you know, if you've got three nodes in three racks, don't just add one node uh, to to one rack uh, and leave. So you've got two in one and, and one in each of the others. That will uh, result in some unbalance. Ideally, you want to keep it uh, balanced across the cluster. We actually enforce this here, um, for our managed service clusters. Uh, if, if people have add nodes, 
efforts with ambulance to ensure that they keep the racks evenly distributed. <clears throat> Only add one note at a time, um, <clears throat> just to be sure that uh, the the ranges are kept uh, in sync and things that things are not getting uh, mixed up around the cluster. Um, <clears throat> only do one at a time. For that reason, also adding nodes can add uh, a little bit of additional load to the existing nodes. Obviously, it needs to to stream data to that node that's joining. Uh, doing more of the, multiple ones of those at the same time um, can could potentially be more load than your cluster can sustain. <clears throat> uh, whilst the node is joining, it's accepting writes but not reads. So uh, one thing we always do is uh, unthrottle that compaction throughput. As I said, it's streaming data from the other nodes. It needs to uh, compact all of that, those incoming SS tables together uh, so that they um, are optimised for read performance. <clears throat> You're not doing any reads whilst it's joining. Uh, so you can safely unthrottle that compaction throughput. However, once the node is joined, you will almost immediately want to throttle that um, compaction throughput down to a more reasonable number. I recommend 16 or 32 uh, is fine for almost all cases. Uh, higher than that, you're potentially affecting um, your, your queries. <clears throat> One thing that's pretty common uh, that we that we used to see in our clusters uh, is uh, we'd have have nodes joining with unthrottled compactions. It's uh, the, at the at the exact instance that the node joined and started accepting reads, it was still running unthrottled compactions, and we'd we'd get alerted for latency on the cluster. We've now got ways of actually. Uh, resetting that compaction throughput automatically uh, once that node is joined to to get around that problem. Uh, you can monitor joining status with node tool netstats. Uh, I've just noticed I've left a little note in there. Uh, see next page. I think I've actually removed that slide, so um, I'm, I'm, I might fix that for the final one. Uh, but you can type it into your own cluster. You'll see exactly what I mean. Uh, it, it comes up with a display that the node is joining, and it, it tells you about how much data is still being streamed and how much it has to go. Uh, and final note there, if you're using LCS and a version of Cassandra uh, before 2.2.x, um, uh, the, the level information is not preserved on streaming. Uh, so the, certainly for, for clusters where we've done added nodes to with, with this configuration, um, the entire data set needs to be compacted through every level and that can take days if not weeks to get through. To be aware of that. Uh, later versions of Cassandra, uh, it's been fixed. It, it will preserve that uh, level information. So it needs to uh, just do the normal compactions. Uh, replacing nodes. Um, fact of life in the cloud. I'm sure many of you are, are running on AWS. Uh, fact of life instances die. Uh, it happens all the time. Uh, Replacing nodes in Cassandra is pretty simple. Uh, you just put this option uh, that I've put there, replace address first boot, in the end before you start Cassandra. Uh, and that is a little flag that, yep, this node that's coming up is replacing a dead node. Uh, and Cassandra will work it out itself. It will automatically uh, just stream the data that that other node was responsible for. Again, you can monitor that with, um, with NetStat. If you're on a newer version of Cassandra uh, and you replace using a different IP address, the node will get all writes while it's joining. Uh, otherwise, um, if you're using the same IP address or um, uh, you're on an earlier version, you'll need to run a repair to catch up on any writes that that node should have got or that, that replace node should have got whilst it was streaming data or in the replacing state. <clears throat> okay, adding DCs. Uh, this is actually something we do uh, very, very often at Insta Cluster um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, maybe customer just wants to distribute workload across other data centers or regions. Um, but the, actually, the, the two key reasons why we, we do additional DCs or DC migrations as we call them, is to implement major topology changes. 
or to migrate clusters into our own service. Um, so major topology change would be something like um, if you, you know, going back to my example before about splitting your nodes across logical, uh, physical and logical racks in Cassandra, if you currently in your cluster are running, you know, just, just one logical rack uh, or one physical rack and you wanted to move to that configuration, that's not something that you could safely do in place, actually you couldn't do in place you would need to, or well, the best way to do that with no downtime and no impact to your cluster is by standing up a whole second DC with the target configuration that you want and migrating your data to it. So it's handy, yep, not just for, for adding new DCs, but you know, for doing these topology changes or, or if you need to do a migration, uh, that is the easiest way to do it. So I'm gonna go through the, the just quick high level steps on, on how you do that. <clears throat> the first thing that you want to check is that all your key spaces are using network topology strategy. There's really no reason in my mind to ever use simple strategy. Uh, it's there, it's not very flexible. Uh, our advice to all of our customers is start with network topology strategy. Maybe you don't think that you'll need to run multi-DC, but uh, it, it, in almost all cases you'll you'll hit something where you where you need to do this and you need network topology strategy. It's a simple change, you can just do alter key space. Uh, if, you, if you are running a simple strategy, just alter key space, uh, just make sure you keep the, the replication um, factors the same. Very simple. <clears throat> now you're adding, a, you'll be adding a new DC to your existing cluster. Uh, whilst that DC is, is, is sort of rebuilding, uh, and getting the data it needs. Uh, you don't want any queries being accidentally routed there. Uh, so you need to be sure in your application that you're using a local consistency level everywhere. Um, if you're not, if you were say using um, just, just straight quorum or even all, um, <clears throat> uh, once that new DC is joined, uh, uh, the queries will, will rather your the coordinator can check for replicas in that new DC and it might not have populated those replicas yet uh, and the query will fail. So you, whilst you're undergoing this operation, just need to be sure that everything is contained within that original DC. <clears throat> um, okay, so once you've gone through the, those basic client checks, uh, the next thing is to, you bring up the new DC. Now, a DC is really just a, a logical grouping of nodes a, until it's joined to another DC. It's a it's a cluster in its own right, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so, provision nodes, configure Cassandra. A uh, few key points that you need to do here: you, the cluster name needs to match the YAML in the original DC. Uh, you know, good advice. Uh, take the YAML from your original DC, customize only the bits that you need to and, and don't change the cluster name. The DC name uh, must be unique in the cluster, so if you're using uh, your original DC is named US West and you're standing up a new DC in the same region, you'd need to call this new one US West 1 or US West New, that, that, that string must be unique in the cluster. Um, and the, the key thing is you just include a, some seed nodes from the other original DC and as soon as you start Cassandra, uh, it will uh, join to the, go to those seed nodes and discover the other nodes. Um, once it's up and running and joined, now you might need to, to open up some firewall rules or VPC peering or whatever your particular uh, configuration is. Um, start Cassandra, the, all the nodes should be able to see each other and you've got an empty DC uh, joined to your existing DC. Key thing to make it all, to make the magic happen, um, change the replication on your key spaces. Now remember that's gonna include your system auth key space uh, so that you can authenticate to the new DC. Um, so you change the replication factor with an older key space to include your new DC and use the DC name that you've put in your new rack DC properties file. And then from each uh, node, uh, you execute a node tool rebuild. And that rebuilds the node with the data for the replicas that it is responsible for. Uh, you can do this on multiple nodes at a time. It's entirely safe to do that. Um, 
my advice is uh, start with one and add more and stop when you, you know, if you're noticing any adverse effects on your cluster. Uh, so we sort of, when we do this, we, we do one node, then we might add a few more and usually we can get to around sort of three, four, five nodes at a time. Um, I've seen cases of, of people doing this, you know, on 16 plus nodes at a time. Uh, it didn't go so well. It um, actually caused an outage on their original DC, just that, that huge extra amount of work that, of, that those nodes had to do to stream replicas to this new DC. Uh, it couldn't cope. So start slow, uh, add more as your cluster can tolerate. <clears throat> uh, which I guess brings me to, to my final tips. Uh, and I just said it then. If you're making major changes to your clusters, expanding, migrating, decommissioning, go slow. Uh, it, it might seem like it's going to be faster you know, to rush and, and do everything at the same time, but believe me, uh, if, you, if you go too fast, uh, the recovery time will likely be a lot longer, uh, a, lot more, <laughs> a lot harder, a lot more catastrophic, potentially with outage, than just uh, starting slow and, uh, and ramping up as, as, um, as a cluster can tolerate. Um, <clears throat> So there's my example, yep, rebuilding 15 nodes in a DC concurrently, uh, decommissioning multiple nodes uh, at, run, at once, uh, and the other big one, uh, unthrottled data loads. Um, you know, if you migrate to Cassandra, that, that's great, uh, but, you know, unless you have a facility to throttle the right load going into the cluster, uh, you can overwhelm it. So the next point, don't overload your cluster. Um, uh, we've, we've had a couple of really bad cases of production clusters um, in our managed service where people had run an unthrottled data load. Uh, the cluster had become so overloaded. Uh, Cassandra, um, uh, you know, crashed during the load. Uh, it got itself into a state uh, where it was very, very difficult to recover from. Uh, you know, we, we were dealing with corrupt commit logs, corrupt SS tables, um, uh, corrupt data, uh, we had to manually delete things, it was uh, awful to recover from. So, you know, just be aware Cassandra is a little bit fragile, there is a threshold, uh, don't cross it. Uh, it's, not, it's not a fun place to get yourself out of. Uh, keep Cassandra up to date, you know, there's always, um, there, there's always new bug fixes and improvements coming out, uh, but not too up to date. Um, my advice uh, is keep in touch with the project, um, Keep an eye on the, the dev list, um, the, the user mailing list on IRC. Get a sense of what's, what, what's out there or, you know, what's happening in the project at the moment. Um, you know, at the moment, uh, materialized views still have a number of major bugs. Uh, we're certainly not recommending that, that people are using that in a production context at this point in time. Uh, even though that is, you know, the most up-to-date version of Cassandra, uh, we don't feel that it's production ready. So. Um, you know, often problems can be solved with an upgrade, um, but just be aware of, of what's included in the upgrade. Uh, and finally, uh, read the source code. I mean, there, there are heaps of great resources out there on the internet now for, for Cassandra. Uh, the, the project document, documentation is getting much, much better, but I think if you really uh, want to understand how things work in detail and if you're seeing some, something that maybe you don't quite understand or an error message that you don't quite understand, um, Clone the project, open it up on, on your laptop uh, and have a read through the source code. And, um, I have to say that's really how I've learned the most about Cassandra, that, uh, you know, reading the source code, really tracing it through and seeing what's happening at runtime. So, yeah, definitely, definitely do that. Um, so, yeah, just a quick slide on, on really more about what it does. I don't want to turn this into a sales presentation, um, but just to give you a sense of, you know, the environment that I operate in. Uh, we have three uh, arms to our business. Uh, our core service is our, our managed service. You can go to our console, um, spin up a Cassandra cluster in, in less than half an hour, in fact, much less than half an hour. Um, it's really simple. You just you know, pick the cloud provider that you want, the version of Cassandra that you want, uh, how many DCs, how many nodes. You know, uh, click in, you know, tick a box with whatever security configuration that you want, press go, uh, our provisioning system automatically goes out and, and spins that all up for you uh, and, and we manage it from there. Um, <clears throat> there's access to, you know, we, we've built a, a monitoring UI, I've included a little screenshot there, um, and, you know, that 
all the nodes are monitored on an ongoing basis uh, and uh, it's my team, our ops team, that, that manages that and responds to that. Um, we also do consulting, so you know, all we do is Cassandra. We've built up a pretty big body of knowledge about how it works and how to do Cassandra well. Um, so you know, you can access uh, our people and our engineers and our team on a, for a consulting basis. You know, to if you're already running a cluster and you just you want us to come in and, and have a look at what you're doing and give you some advice on, on how you might be able to do things better. Um, you know, we can do these health reviews. Uh, if you want, uh, say, one of our engineers to, to work with you on, on a new Cassandra project, uh, for example, to, to help you design a data model that will work well for, for your application and Cassandra, we can do that too. The final thing we offer is what we call enterprise support. So there's certainly uh, plenty of use cases out there where people aren't able to, to host with on our managed service for whatever reason. Um, we provide a, a third level support for Apache Cassandra um, where you still run your own cluster, um, but we provide a third level support for you. And that, that could be anything from, from emergency support, you know, we're having an outage, please, please help us restore service, uh, to uh, you know, uh, ongoing maintenance of the cluster or, or understanding how Cassandra works or, or even um, diagnosing and, and resolving or well, patching bugs in Cassandra. Um, okay, well that brings us to the <clears throat> to the end of the of the presentation. Uh, I've linked some resources there. Uh, that that were the first one that was was uh, mentioned in the presentation. We have a tech blog. Um, we frequently publishing articles on there on all sorts of things to do with Cassandra uh, and and how that works and how to do do different things in Cassandra. So definitely check that out. And of course. Uh, if you want to contact us at any time, uh, hit us up support at infocluster.com. There's always someone there to answer questions. So Gina, um, uh, do we have any questions from the audience now? Yes, thank you so much, Brooke. The content was fantastic. And just as a reminder to the audience, uh, any questions you have, please, please feel free to type them in now. Um, Brooke, we do have a couple right now. Uh, the first question, aside from compactions, what are the other common problems that you see? Um, <clears throat> I think probably the next most most common uh, problem, I guess, would be or thing that we're, we're asked is repairs and side effects of repairs. How do you get it working? What to do if it's causing a problem? Um, other common ones would be uh, where people aren't just doing those basic health checks. Um, I'll stress again how important that is. Understand what the status of your cluster is. Uh, you need to know if there are nodes down. Um, you know, we particularly with some of our enterprise support customers had people come to us, you know, complaining of one particular issue. But when we, you know, look a little bit further, um, <clears throat> we find that that actually the the real issue that um, that uh, that we sorry the real issue that we're that we're seeing is, is that there's multiple nodes down in the cluster and that that's caused the latency. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank uh, you. And still, yep. So mm -hmm. the next one is, how do you implement monitoring and alerting for Cassandra? Oh, how, yeah, how weird into cluster, how, yeah, I guess how in general. Uh, so you can, um, you can interface with, with JMX, um, uh, which, is, which is how we do it. So, and, and also how, you know, something like DataStack's Ops Center does it as well. Uh, you can uh, connect via JMX, query the particular MBeans, and in fact, I, I gave uh, specific MBeans that you might want to look at uh, on the, the, the slides, which will be available after the presentation in PDF format. <clears throat> um, you can use uh, things like JConsult to connect to nodes and also browse those uh, to see which ones might be, might be useful for you. Um, so that's how you actually get access to, to those counters in Cassandra and you can query that, that JMX interface as, as often as you need. There are thousands of them. Um, there's a few different places you can find out. Um, I think probably the easiest thing, at least from, from my mind, is to use something like like a 
um, like day console and, 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 and browse browse those beans from Cassandra itself. But uh, you can look in the source code. There are some pages online that, that, that summarize them for you as well. Uh, as for what to alert on and what to set the threshold for, um, I think that's, that's really case by case basis. Uh, every application is different. Everyone has different mm, latency requirements, for example. Um, so it's, I think it's a case there of, of picking a starting point and, and, and looking what sort of alerts you get um, and, uh, and tuning from there. So I would say if you're going to do that, you know, for latency, for example, start maybe 50 milliseconds for reads and 20 milliseconds for writes and have a look at, um, uh, have a look at what, um, what alerts are coming out of it and, um, and uh, tune from there. Great. And another question we got in, which um, we get asked a lot, is uh, in regards to uh, some of our <laughs> excuse me, um, some of our competition. Is what is our biggest value proposition at InstaCluster if you're looking for a managed solution? Uh, it's easy. <laughs> uh, you don't have to do it yourself. We do it all for you. Um, so. Um, you know, as I, as I said, you can go to the console and, and and spin up a cluster really quickly. You know that it's configured correctly. Um, you know that it's got monitoring on it. You know that there is a team of Cassandra experts there, 24 by 7, uh, watching that for you and and helping you make make best use of that. Uh, so that you know, there's there's all that maintenance that you don't you don't need to to pay a team of people to do this. Uh, Cassandra, you know, it's a steep learning curve, I guess, for an organisation to uh, to take on both. You know, if, you, if you're just starting with Cassandra, to take on both, you know, learning that from a development perspective as well as how to manage that from an operational perspective. That's a huge undertaking, um, and, and probably you know more than I would recommend that you that you bite off in the first instance. Um, so that, that managed service makes that really easy. You've got access to, to our expertise uh, 24 by 7. Um, we, we've, got a pretty, we've got a strong commitment to Apache Cassandra, open source Cassandra. Uh, we, um, we support that. Um, we support Apache Cassandra. So uh, my guys in particular in TechOps, uh, we are active in the project. Um, we, we do... Uh, you know, participate in the dev mailing list and um, um, participate in in um, in the project and committing um, code back to the project. So, I guess we're we're in a pretty unique uh, position here at InstaCluster that we have, you know, production uh, production experience with all different versions of Cassandra. Um, we, we have everything from very early version versions of uh, 2.1 uh, all the way up to the latest versions of 3. Uh, so we sort of see uh, and experience bugs in, in all of those versions. And there's been uh, uh, quite a number of cases now where um, we've actually, you know, seen some, some odd behavior in a, in a customer cluster, uh, being able to isolate that down to a bug in, in the Apache standard code base. Uh, we've uh, reproduced it. Um, uh, produced a fix for it and then submitted that that patch back to the project. So, um, it, you know, the, the the support that we provide is not just for, you know, the, the instances and nodes themselves. It's actually for, you know, it goes as deep as the Apache Cassandra code itself. Great. I will give you guys a few more minutes to just quickly type in your questions if there are any questions that are left. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. We do have another webinar coming up at the 1st of June. The title is Cassandra Fighter Fighting and Consulting. So it'll be an interesting uh, presentation. The CTO and co-founder of InstaCluster, Ben Bromhead, will be speaking for this one. And it looks like we have no other questions. So Brooke, thank you again for your time today. There was a lot of great content there. Again, to the audience, if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact us either at info at instacluster.com or support at instacluster.com. Thanks again for your time, and we look forward to holding another webcast for you shortly. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you.